Hello, welcome again to Siempre Siendo Reformados. My name is Andres Martinez, and I'm from Puerto Rico. Today, we're going to talk about the doctrine of unconditional election, the second point of Calvinism. I'm going to give a brief explanation of this doctrine, uh, because I always like uh, to give explanations, even though some of you may already be well aware of the issues. But maybe there's someone here who has heard of this doctrine but doesn't understand it that well, so I always like to, in all my videos, give explanations of the doctrines that I'm going to put forward to you. So I'm going to, give, I'm going to be giving uh, this explanation of the doctrine, and then we will be looking at a key biblical text that proves this doctrine. So the doctrine of unconditional election. We have already established, for example, in, in other videos, um, the doctrine of original sin and total depravity. Uh, that is, after the fall of Adam, when Adam and Eve sinned, all humanity inherited this corruption of sin. All humanity uh, became sinners. They, they sinned against God. Uh, and therefore, after, after, the fall, we all, after the fall, we are all enslaved to sin, enemies of God. Uh, we are all uh, slaves and dead in sin. So we all deserve uh, the wrath of God. We all deserve to be punished uh, by God for all eternity and be separated from Him for all eternity. Now God can do that. He can punish us all. Uh, in fact, He can do three things. He can punish us all for our sins and, and for us being against Him and being His enemies. He can punish us all. He can save us all, and that's what Universalists believe. They believe that because of the atoning work of Christ, uh, all the sins of all human beings have been pardoned, and therefore all humanity goes to heaven, and that we know that is not what the Bible teaches. Now, the third option is what Calvinists and Arminians believe alike. That is, that God chose to save a specific group of people, and Arminians believe that, because they believe that human beings are uh, capable of choosing or rejecting God's grace. And so automatically, if humanity is capable of doing that, we know that not all human beings will choose to accept uh, God's grace. So automatically, God will save a specific group, that is, those who believe. So we, Calvinists and Arminians, believe that God chose to save a specific group of people. That, But, but the difference is... How did God do it? And we agree it was through the atoning work of Christ, but it is the question of the election of these people. How does God elect these people? And for some Arminians that believe in some concept of election, it ultimately boils down to saying God chose me because he foresaw I was going to choose him, or God chose me because he knew I was going to choose him, something along those lines. Uh, but for us Calvinists, we believe that God chose us not because he saw something in us, not because of our works, not because of anything in us. He chose us before the foundation of the world, out of pure love, out of pure grace, because we did not deserve his grace, but he freely decided to give us that grace. And that love. So that is the doctrine of unconditional election. Now we will look at this text that proves this doctrine, that is 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 9. And here, when we talk about uh, every everyone says that we need to look at the context of the text uh, before we make an argument or before we put forward an interpretation of the text. Everyone says that, and everyone thinks they're studying the text uh, by studying the context. Everyone thinks uh, their, their context is right. Um, but something really important when studying something in its context is looking at the flow of the text. That is. You read the text, and you can 
easily listen to the idea fluidly. That is, the author is presenting an idea here, and you can uh, really easy uh, see how this phrase is connected to the other. And so you see the argument of the author fluidly in some kind of flow. I, be, uh, I don't know if I'm explaining that correctly, but you will get that in a moment. So we need to do that. We need to see how this first statement relates to the other. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to read only verse 8. And then we're going to ask a key question that will be answered in verse 9. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 8 says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of, about our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Now, uh, as we heard, Paul is telling Timothy to not uh, be ashamed of the gospel, to not be ashamed of, of Paul himself, who is a prisoner at this time, because it's really easy for this kind of people to feel ashamed, to feel scared, and to, to leave the faith, actually, even though we believe in the perseverance of the saints, and believe that those who leave the faith were never regenerated in the first place, but that's another issue. Uh, it's really easy for the people who say there are Christians in this time to, to leave the faith. It's really easy for them because they have this pressure that they may be imprisoned or killed by the persons who persecute them. So it's really easy. And Paul has to make sure that Timothy is firm in the faith and is confident about the gospel he has believed. And so Paul tells him, do not be ashamed of the gospel even though I am prisoner, even though we're being persecuted and we are in danger by believing this gospel. Do not uh, be ashamed. Now, if you're telling this kind of person who is in this kind of situation, if you're telling them to not be afraid, there must be a good reason. Because you are believing something that could get you killed or could get you imprisoned. So there must be a good reason for uh, staying in the faith. And that is what Paul gives to Timothy in verse 9. So that's the key question. What is the reason? Why is Paul uh, telling Timothy to not be ashamed if they are actually in danger by believing this gospel. What is that reason? He gives that uh, in verse 9. We're going to read the two verses now with this question in mind, and let's see how Paul answers that question. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord nor of me his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us all, who saved us and called us to a holy calling. Now that's the reason. Timothy, why you shouldn't be afraid, why you shouldn't be ashamed of the gospel? Because God has called us, and uh, because God has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Now, we need to explain something about this calling. If we are Arminians, uh, we believe that all people are called equally to the gospel. All people are, are called equally to the grace of God. But Paul specifies here that the calling of Timothy and of himself is a holy calling. It says God called us to a holy calling, or the Greek allows also with a holy calling. So why is he specifying it? Well, a reason could be that we have texts like uh, Acts 17.30. God commands all people everywhere to repent. Now, in this sense, everyone is called. Everyone is called in the sense that everyone everywhere is commanded to repent because the gospel is not an invitation. God is not inviting anyone to repent. God is commanding everyone to repent. And there is an important difference between those two. 
the gospel is not a mere invitation it is something that you have to obey in fact there are I think three uh, places in the New Testament where Paul speaks about unbelievers and he says that they disobey the gospel so uh, it's not uh, it's not a mere invitation it is something you uh, if you're not a believer it is something you are disobeying and if you're a believer it is something you're obeying it is a command that people obey and other people disobey so in this sense uh, Paul um, uh, Luke told uh, these people in, in Acts 17.30 that in this sense everyone is called that God commands everyone everywhere to repent but there is a specific or special calling which is the one Paul is talking to Timothy that is a holy calling and how does Paul describe uh, this holy calling or what are the characteristics of this of this calling we will see that now uh, Paul said who saved us and called us to a holy calling not because of our works so Paul called uh, God called Timothy and Paul not because of their works not because of anything in them in them that is this calling did not depend on their works or their suffering or their effort it depended solely on what uh, it says not because of our works but because of his own purpose and grace so God uh, Paul is saying had a purpose in saving and calling Timothy to a holy calling so it did not depend on Timothy it depended on God who was the one that called Timothy according to his purpose according to his grace and when was Timothy and Paul called Paul tells Timothy that uh, next he says not because of our works but because of his own purpose and grace which he gave us in Christ before the ages began so this grace was given to Timothy and to Paul before the ages began before uh, God created the world this grace was given to them uh, now, now ask that question that important question what is the reason and read this text aloud and listen to the words in your head and and when you do that ask yourself the question how can you not believe in unconditional election if Paul is very clearly giving Timothy the the reality of his election of his unconditional election as the grounds for his confidence as the grounds for Timothy to not be ashamed of the gospel Paul is saying don't be ashamed Timothy because God chose you because God called you not according to your works but according to his grace which he gave you before the ages began so you weren't even born to do any works for God to look at them and say hmm I'm going to choose Timothy no God chose Timothy and Paul because of his purpose and the grace he gave them before the ages began my friends if that is not unconditional election I don't know what that is really take this text ask this important question to yourself and read this text aloud listen to the language the very natural language Paul is using here to describe an election that is unconditional not condi not it is not according to the works that Timothy had done it was according to his grace before he even created the world so this text clearly teaches uh, the doctrine of unconditional election and if you disagree I'm looking forward to any discussion uh, any comments you put on the comment section below or any video response you want to make so uh, I hope this video has been a blessing to you I hope uh, you've understood uh, this text better and I hope you can 
uh, share this with friends and, and family and everyone you like. So thanks for watching. I hope the Spirit reveals this truth to you and helps you in, in your journey of faith. And thanks for watching. God bless.